Hey everybody, welcome to the GMG Review. Today I'm taking a look at one of my favorites, all time, like most sort of like, I don't know, dear to me miniature games, which is Blood Bowl, the game of fantasy football. Uh, I first played this game in the mid 90s when it was a birthday present uh, from my dad on a business trip back from England to me. Uh, and it's been through many iterations, many incarnations. You can watch the Let's Play today, it'll be up here in the cards. Um, to uh, to kind of get your head wrapped around what that means, but this is truly the beautiful the beautiful game. <laughs> if you've never seen Blood Bowl before, it is a riff um, on American football by a uh, UK design studio set in a fantasy universe. It has some. DNA from games of its period when it was first written by Jervis Johnson, uh, like Monsters of the Gridiron, which was a similar sort of fantasy football kind of idea. Uh, but this is definitely, if you were <laughs> if you were to take a sort of like a, a, a large top-down view of wargaming in general uh, and board gaming in general, this game has been probably the longest running, uh, popular, taken and, and played by the fans um, GW game. I would say of all time, like even like, cause now that Warhammer and Fantasy Battle and Age of Sigmar are so, so different and not set in the same world, Blood Bowl is the longest running, I'd say fantasy game, uh, Games Workshop has produced and has the most interesting fans, <laughs> has the most passionate fans, I would say. Um, and this edition of the game, I don't usually gush very much over, over stuff like this because I've seen so many inc incarnations of games, like new editions of a game. This is the best edition of Blood Bowl I think Games Workshop's ever done. I, and I say that unreservedly. The value of the box set's incredible. You can check out the Let's Play to see the value of the box set. The, the player experience in the box set's crazy compared to all previous editions. You get a star player, a big guy. Uh, you get some refs, like the component quality is fantastic. Um, and the rules are, are fresh. Um, they're presented in a very new way. I think we'll get some grumbling from seasoned coaches. Uh, that season, if there's one thing that coaches of Blood Bowl love to do, it's grumble um, about some of the presentation changes. But I think that it, overall, it makes the game more approachable. Um, and what comes in this rule book is is a is a really well refined version of Blood Bowl. So it's 136 pages, well indexed, uh, well presented, and contains two brand new teams: the Boganoff Barons. Uh, and the Thunder Valley Greenskins, which are the Black Orc and um, Imperial Nobility teams. Uh, and and I think this is the, this and Dark, what is it, uh, Dark Uprising, the Necromunda box set, really show how hiring a fresh generation of specialist game designers who grew up playing these games, um, the appreciation of the background, the setting, and the tone uh, has really bled through. I wasn't a huge fan of the previous star set to this one, for a couple of reasons. One, it chopped up um, the experience. You didn't have Blood Bowl League rules really in the main box set. You only got the rules for two teams, the Orcs and the Human teams that came in it. And there was a lot of like, this is just gonna focus you on playing a game with these two teams. No rules for star players, inducements, any of that stuff. Um, like a stripped down board game experience. It didn't contain everything that makes Blood Bowl really great. This rule book comes in the two player star set. It's hardcover and it contains all of that stuff. So if we go to the index here, we have the history of Blood Bowl. It is, it is a really well done, like, like even like the history of what's happening here from the finding of Blood Bowl uh, during a battle between dwarves and greenskins and Roselle, the near blind dwarf, deciphering the, the, the competition rules. Um, the, the rules and regulations, the general points of the game, how to play a, a Blood Bowl in two halves, the aftermask, or aftermath, sorry, skills and traits for all the different models on the table and then inducements, all the different inducements you can buy, excluding special play cards. So special play cards are still a thing from the previous edition, so if you have them, you can still use them, and they're an inducement you buy, um, but don't, don't, they're not gonna be contained in here. So the one thing, the only thing you can't do to this box set is use all the special plays that link to a team, but that's simple because they're, they already exist, they're already out there, and if you own a team, you're probably already able to use them. Uh, then league and exhibition play, so league play, playing a linked series of games from a rookie team becoming more experienced through exhibition play, which is playing a one-off game between um, 1.5 and, or sorry, 11 point, yeah, no, 1.15 and 1.3 million gold pieces to start off. Um, and then the teams, all the teams are in here and all the star players are in here. That stuff was kind of dripped out in the previous incarnation of Blood Bowl through all of the different expansions. And in this, in this single book, you have all of that stuff. So if you played anything in the previous season, all of the rules for it are in here. What you get in the box, you can see here, you can see in the Let's Play as well. Um, two teams, you get 
refs, you get big guys, you get star players, you get the rule book, the cheat sheet, which is excellent, all the, the um, scatter dice and templates and stuff. Uh, you get your passing mark template, your throw in template, dugouts, all the usual Blood Bowl stuff. <laughs> and then the history. Now, one thing you might notice in Blood Bowl is that it has a very different art style. Um, from the other Games Workshop games. And some people have mentioned that as being a negative. I think it's a fabulous positive. Games Workshop didn't used to have a sort of singular art style. And in 40K and in um, Age of Sigmar now, they have very defined art styles. You can tell that those two design teams have a look for the game. And that look is the look for the game. And a few things break it, like the role models cartoon uh, in from Warhammer Community gives Age of Sigmar a very different look, which I absolutely love. And the same with, um, oh, the Orky one. I can't remember what it's called now. Death Squad, not the Death Squad, it's the old one. It's whatever the Orky, the Orky one is. Um, kind of flips out looking at the Blood Bowl has its own style. And I think that style really, like the slant with the hot dog and potato chips, really captures the tongue in cheek essence of Blood Bowl, right? Where you've got like all of the old paraphernalia and tablets and stuff, Cabal Vision. And it's worth noting that Blood Bowl takes place in an alternate version of the Warhammer Old World. It doesn't take place in the Old World. It takes place in a version of the Old World where they've discovered Blood Bowl and they use it to solve all of the Old World's problems versus, um, versus uh, going to war anymore. Uh, and like, look at this, look at how awesome the art style is. It might even be the same artist that does role models. I'm not sure, because I, I didn't see it credited. Is it credited? No, of course not. Mm, no, just the usual boilerplate. Um, but yeah, you get chainsaws. All the, all the original characters are Bim Bifford, and, or uh, Bob Bifford and Jim Johnson, the two commentators, do all the commentary through it. Uh, and it goes through the history of Blood Bowl. Um, and then we get into the, the turf, the pitch. Uh, and where it is. So everything here is defined. There are lots of uh, additional pitches that were released in the last season. They're all still valid, as are the dugouts. Um, your paraphernalia, so your templates, the football, all your markers, like your turn marker, your rerolls, and your score, uh, your templates, uh, your throw-in templates, and your um, scatter templates. So the throw-ins from the edge of the table, range ruler. Uh, and these are used to basically determine when the ball goes out of play when they come back. Rules and regs, so general principles. You got coaches and players. I mess this up in the let's play like crazy. I, I refer to myself as the player occasionally. I should keep referring to myself as the coach. Players are the guys on the board. Coaches are the two people playing the game. Um, and then I love that this is in here too. Take backs and changing your mind. You can take back any move that doesn't require a dice roll. Once you roll dice, everything previous to that dice roll is locked in place. It's a great convention in all of the new Forge World Specialist sort of like studio games and in 40K and Age of Sigmar as well. Fantastic that it's in there. And what's a turnover? A turnover is basically any time you fail to do something. So pick up the ball, pass the ball, you get knocked down uh, if you're knocked prone, or if you score a touchdown, or if you get sent off by um, doing a foul. And then dice rolls, single dice rolls, multiple dice rolls, dice pools, target numbers, modifying dice. Games Workshop um, games don't typically use much more than a d6, but this game does. It uses specialty dice, which is the block die for when you hit somebody. Uh, D6s for cracking armor, rolling on tables and stuff. And then actually a d16 for randomly turning players, because every um, squad in Blood Bowl has a maximum of 16 players, and you roll a d16 to try and determine who's who. General rules for rerolls. Deviating, scattering, and bouncing. So if you deviate, um, you place the template and then deviate using the, the D8 because there's eight different directions it can go on the table. If you scatter, uh, it moves from the square which was placed three times before landing, each time one square in a direction by the D8. So it goes doot, doot, doot. So like if you miss a pass, you scatter the ball to see where it ends up landing. Um, and then you can't uh, catch the ball until the third scatter. And then bouncing just goes in a random direction and that's it. Bounce again if it hits a prone or stun player. And look at this art! <laughs> this is Stein. He's getting kicked in the face. How awesome is that? Uh, player status. You're either standing um, with a tackle zone. You're open if no one's got their tackle zone on you. Tackle zone is all squares around you. You're marked if someone has their tackle zone on you. Um, being marked is important for dodging. It's important for um, picking up and passing the ball. And it's also important for throwing blocks because you can get assists both, both offensively and defensively. Prone and stunned, if you're prone, you're laying face up on the pitch. If you're stunned, you're laying face down. Becoming prone or stunned, it's usually if you fall over or if somebody hits you. Uh, and then your profile. So 
This is the first really big change for existing coaches. Remember, I'm gonna mo mostly focus this run through of the rules on the changes from previous editions, assuming that most people have played Blood Bowl before because it's such an old game. Um, but if you're looking at this for the first time, I'm gonna spend a bit of time talking about what it is. Now the characteristics in this game are the same. You have your move allowments, how many squares you can move between one and nine. Your strength, literally how strong you are between eight and one. Your agility, your um, passing skill, and your armor value, which are all differently presented now. Now, if you go through the teams, when you look through the teams later on, it's still the same numbers in the previous edition if it was a stat. In previous editions, it would have been a stat. Now it's a dice roll. And what that does is it takes out needing additional tables and just presents the information in the player profile. Some old coaches might not like that. I think that anything that removes a step from understanding the information to presenting the information is a good thing. So. If you were agility four before, you would roll a, you have four to six chance of doing something, you'd roll a three plus now, right? So it's the exact same information, just presented differently. It just means you don't have to take your agility score and look on a table. It, for new players, it just makes the, the information more accessible. There's other things too. Certain modifiers are now built in. So your agility, where it used to be your agility stat on a table and then a plus modifier for making a dodge, they just improved everyone's agility stats by one. So when people are like, why does a person who used to be agility three have a three plus agility stat? It's because when you make a dodge or you make a pass, you just get plus one to your skill. They just built that into your stat now. Um, the bonus for things like quick pass or making a pass or picking up a ball or dodging is gone. So it's it was a meaningless integer. It was kept around because there's a, a big you know resistance to change with old coaches. It's just been flattened in the stat line now, and I'm totally fine with that. If it was a core mechanic that added a step in understanding, it didn't need to be there. It just got pulled out, and I'm fine. Um, and so that's, a, that's an important distinction now. The only stats that you roll 2d6 on are armor value, and that's the dice you need to break someone's armor. So your opponent typically rolls that stat against you. So it's lowest 3+, plus, highest 11+, plus, um, and it's 2d6 versus the value. Drafting a Blood Bowl team. So, two different ways of doing it. Like I said earlier, when you draft a squad member, there's mins and maxes. Some teams have uh, access to zero to two of something or you know one to 12 of something. You have to have at least one of something, typically. You have to have at least three players in a Blood Bowl team because you have to have three in the line of scrimmage. You should have at least 11. Uh, otherwise, you're drafting in journeymen, which are like, you know, once you use them once and they're gone, kind of like rogue players. Um, and in a uh, like one-off exhibition game, you get between uh, 1.15 million and 1.3 million gold crowns to draft. Here's your roster. This is the exact same roster as every other edition of Blood Bowls used. 16 players and then your games, game record sheet. Uh, you get different positions. So things like linemen, blitzers, throwers, catchers, runners, blockers, other positions that might just exist for just a uh, a uh, certain number of teams. And then big guys who are typically anyone who's um, a, a like huge dude. Uh, the ogre and the train troll in this box that would be big guys. And then all your different stuff, your sideline staff. So you can purchase rerolls for the team, which will have a cost and be different for every team and then a number that you can take. Uh, your coach is you, for your free. Assistant coaches you can hire for 10 grand. Cheerleaders, apothecaries uh, are really important in league play because they keep your guys alive if they die. And then other information, your treasury, how much money you got left over, your dedicated fans, it always starts at one, can never go below one. You can buy them for 10,000 gold by buying advertisements basically, and they aid in how much money you make during the course of a game, and also um, your fan factor. And then your team value. It's worked out by adding the current value of all the players on your team, plus all the costs of your sideline staff and all your rerolls. And that's your team value. Your current team value, you, you do at the beginning of your match, when you play your opponent, and the differential can be used to buy things called inducements, which we'll talk about later. And then the rules. So it's a game in two halves. Now you play 16 turns of Blood Bowl in a game of Blood Bowl. And turns can happen. They can take a long time. A lot of smart cagey players who don't like to roll dice will have a lot of movement and caging happen. In which case they tend to have it hot. It's more of a chess game. Or they can happen really fast. Your first action, you can fail the roll and turn it over. But all 16 turns typically happen. And then you um, reset and kick off uh, every time you score or every time the half ends. Uh, you start off setting up a game by determining how many fans are there, D3 plus your dedicated fans, the weather, roll on the weather chart, and for the first time ever, 4 to 10 is not called nice perfect Blood Bowl weather, it's called perfect conditions. I don't know why they made that little change, but I've heard Christian say nice perfect Blood Bowl weather so many times in my life now, that seeing that result not be nice perfect Blood Bowl weather 
has weirded me out. So Chris, I'm with you. If you don't like that, that's the only thing in this rule book that I'll, I'll, be, I'll be weird and grown yardy about is that they changed that, that terminology. It's stupid and pointless and isn't really a criticism, but I don't know why that didn't change. Um, and you can have everything from sweltering heat down to a blizzard can take place and it'll affect the conditions on the table. Uh, then you take on journeymen. So if there's a big difference in team value, you can hire journeymen up to at least your minimum amount of squad members. So if you don't have 11 uh, players, you, you get journeymen to try and do so based on the differential in your team values. Uh, you can buy inducements if you're left over cash, which is all, which is anything in your treasury plus the difference in your team values when you're playing in a league game. Doesn't typically happen in an exhibition game because exhibition game you're just both buying inducements freely basically. And then prayers to nuffle. If one team still has a lower uh, team value than the other, you can buy prayers to nuffle, which is just you pray for help from the god of football. And then determine the giving team. You just flip a coin. Uh, you've got your team coins, and the person who comes up or the blood bowl symbol will be the the kicker. Yeah, prayers and awful, all kinds of cool things can happen. Uh, you can get bad habits, people become loners 2+. Plus. Uh, under scrutiny until the end of this half, any player in the opposing team that commits a foul is automatically seen by the referee because they, they keep like hanging out and staring at them. <coughs> and you start a drive. So you set up your players, three in the line of scrimmage minimum. If you can't put three in the line of scrimmage, which is the center zone of the table, then you're going to automatically um, uh, four for the game. You just you don't have a squad anymore. You have maximum of two in the wings and the rest can be anywhere else. Wings are the two wide zones and they have to be in your half. Uh, kick off, the kicking player places first, the receiving player places second, and then you scatter the ball, place it in the other opponent's half, scatter it to see where it goes, and then roll the kickoff table and all kinds of things can happen. Everything from the weather changing um, to a quick snap, D3 plus three open players can just immediately move a square. Uh, to a pitch invasion where D3 players on the opponent's team just become knocked down and stunned, <laughs> which is just awful. Uh, you'll see that happen at least once in the Let's Play. One of those things happen. And then a team turn. And a team turn is um, every player on your team can take an action. But again, turnovers can occur if you fail a dice roll typically. So when you're playing Blood Bowl, you want to take all your actions that don't involve a dice roll before you start doing ones that involve a dice roll, unless they're like a chain action, which is going to happen later on after you've uh, you know accomplished something. Like you pass to someone, then they run. Um, but a good Blood Bowl player will spend his opponent's part of the, the turn and a couple seconds at the start of his turn thinking about like do we what what do i do first what do i ma make sure i get done like standing players up rolling them over from stunned uh before i start actually rolling dice to make sure i don't turn myself over by accident and it goes receiving player kicking player receiving player kicking player until the half ends at which point you flip and the uh, person who's receiving previously becomes the kicking player for the second half and then movement, you move your number of squares up equal to your move allowance. You can also do things like dodge. If you're marked by a player uh, and you're trying to move out of a marked square, then you have to make a dice roll, an agility test, and you're minus one for every tackle zone that was on you when you made it or that's on you when you go in, um, whichever one's greatest. So that's a bit of a new thing, uh, is you're, when you're leaving tackle zones now, they all apply, not the tackle zones in the square you're going to, but that could be, that's, that's increased by the fact that everyone's agility values basically are improved by one um, to mark the, the improvement that you would have for making a dodge in previous rules. That's a bit of a change. All right. <laughs> Another thing, nice for global weather. Also, go for it is no longer called go for it. It's called rushing. So it's not called go for it. I don't know why. It's 20, 30 years of something like it being called go for it. It's not called go for it anymore. But it's basically you can move to two extra squares when you when you uh, have your movement action. Uh, but on a two plus, it's successful. On a one, you get knocked prone and you, you turn over. So going for it means you're just you're sprinting a little bit extra, and it's a very risky but common thing to do to try and get some extra movement. And that's you typically don't go for it unless you absolutely have to to do something like a blitz, uh, which is a movement plus a block action or a special action. Um, uh, but because it, it'll you'll roll that one when 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 it's time to have that happen, you can jump over prone players now. It's kind of like a go for it. Blitz actions are a move plus a block. Only one player in each uh, player turn can make a blitz action, which is important to do. Uh, there's certain other actions that only one person can do. You move into a square with the ball. You pick it up. Um, if you're marked, you're minus one per marking player. If the player attempting to pick up the ball uh, fails, it'll bounce and it's turned over. After successfully picking up the ball, the player may continue moving if they wish. And then passing, now that's what that big template's for. There's four zones, there's no modify. Again, your agility or your passing skill is typically increased in this, in this edition. So there's no more plus one for quick snaps. It's no mods for quick pass, minus one for short, minus two for long, minus three for a long bomb. That's 
basically the same as previous editions. <laughs> uh, you can also hand off. Uh, inaccurate passes. Uh, if the passing ability test has failed, it becomes inaccurate, of course, and then the, uh, it'll do a um, scatter. So it's, it bounces three times, basically, before it lands. Then you determine where it lands, and that person can, can, can try and catch it if it gets there, but no matter what, it's a turnover. If it's wildly inaccurate, if you roll a one, it'll deviate from the square occupied by the player performing the pass action before landing, which means you drop it. So if you roll a one where you're making a pass, you drop the ball. And then fumbled, if, the, if when making the passing ability test natural one is rolled, the pass has been fumbled. If the player has a pass skill of dash, the pass is automatically fumbled. When a pass action is fumbled, the activation of the uh, player performing it immediately ends. The ball is dropped, bouncing from the square occupied by the player before the action and turnover is caused. And then interference, of course. Um, players in the way can interfere with the pass. You resolve the pass action, try and catch the ball. Uh, as in previous editions, an agility test. Uh, if the player is attempting to cast an accurate pass or a handoff, there's no modifiers. If the player is attempting to convert a deflection, so a, a handoff is if you're adjacent to a model when you make a pass, um, you automatically make it accurate. If the player is attempting to convert a deflection or an interception, apply minus one. If you're attempting to catch a bouncing ball, it's minus one. If you're attempting to catch a ball that's been thrown in by the crowd, it's minus one. If you're attempting to catch a ball that's uh, scattered or deviated into the square they occupy, apply minus one. So basically if it's bouncing or if it's a wild ball, it's minus a whole bunch of minuses. And then throw on top from the table edge, you put the throw edge template in the last ball uh, space it occupied, and then uh, basically the arc is one a, a D3, uh, and it goes 2D6 squares when it gets thrown back in by the crowds. You can throw other players too, so trolls can pick up goblins. There's the, there's the troll. Look at him. Gonna throw that goblin real good. That goblin does not look excited about it either. And then they have to make an agility test to land. Blocking. So now this is the specialty dice. Um, there are six out of dice that are blocked dice. They result in a variety of different things, such as POWs, stumbles. POWs are a five plus. And you've got one of each of the following results. A stumble, which is it's a POW unless you have the dodge skill. A pushback, which drives you back. Um, a both down, uh, which you can ignore if you have the block skill. And also certain things can now affect it, like the wrestle skill allows you to both go prone instead with no armor roll. Um, you can also uh, re-roll it if you have brawler, which is amazing, which is a skill the black works all have. Pushback pushes you in a square and you can follow up. And then player down, if you make a block action, roll that. Unfortunately, that means that you are knocked down yourself. The opponent that you're trying to block sucker punches you and you go down. Um, and this is a compared dice roll. So you compare your strength uh, of your blocking player to the strength of the person that they're blocking against. If it's equal, it's one die, and you can get assistance uh, from players adjacent, plus and minus, as long as they don't have anyone else blocking them as well, marking them. Um, so your strength can go up and down based on the number of assists that you have. And what will happen is big players like trolls who are like strength five will need to be blocked down. And you can, through careful positioning, actually team up uh, team members to try and actually take them out. So they're not invincible, right? If you're lower, however, you have to roll an additional die if you're lower in strength in the thing you're blocking and pick the worst possible result for you or your opponent picks. And then um, if you're twice as low, it's three dice pick the lowest. But the same vice versa. If you're higher strength, it's two dice pick the best by you. And if it's uh, double or more strength, then it's three dice pick the best. And then you apply the results, push players. And once they're uh, knocked down, if they get powed, they have to make an armor check. And that's that dice roll versus your armor value. If they beat it, you roll a result to see what happens. And you can be damaged. On a two to seven, you're stunned. You're placed face down instead of face up, and you have to spend a turn basically rolling over. On a f eight nine, you're KO'd. You're put back in the dugout, and you might wake up after the half or after a touchdown happens, but chances are you're out for the game unless you can roll lots of four pluses. Um, you can get bonuses, though, by buying inducements like Bloodweiser kegs. You can just have beer on hand, so people are a little less, little less injury prone. Uh, and then casualties on a 10 plus, you're just in the casualty box and you might be dead. You roll immediately to see if that guy's neck got snapped. Stungy players are little, and they're more prone to injury. So a two to six is stunned, seven plus is KO'd, nine is badly hurt. They don't get a casualty result, um, but they have to roll on the badly hurt table, and then casualty is again on a 10 plus, they're out. So badly hurt is you're not KO'd, but you're also not like seriously injured or dead. And the players can also get injured by getting pushed into the crowd. The crowd beats them up and you make an immediate injury roll. And if you get casualtied, <laughs> one to six, you're badly hurt, you miss the next game, but it's uh, 
the rest of this game, but no long-term effects. 7-9, serious hurt, you miss the next game. 10-19, you're niggling injury and miss the next game. 13-14, to 14, your uh, characteristics are reduced by something and you miss the next game. And on 15 or 16, you're just straight up dead. So you roll the D16 and see what happens. It used to be a D66 table. They've introduced the D16 now into doing that. Uh, and you roll to see what your injuries are. And then apothecaries and substitutions, you want to hire an apothecary, they're super handy to keep your guys alive. Uh, but it's worth, worth noting that they do cost 100k. <laughs> So they're another blitzer, pretty much. Okay, and while they're down, you can foul people, but the ref might get called. So you basically, if you're adjacent to somebody and not marked, you can foul a team player or an opponent that's uh, prone or uh, um, stunned next to you. And you just immediately make an armor roll against them. And you get plus one for everybody else putting the boots in and minus one for everybody else marking you out. Uh, if you roll a double though, you get sent out, the, but you can also argue the call and see what happens. <laughs> so it's neat because certain inducements and certain teams, like for instance, once per game, the bribery and corruption on the Black Orcs means they can reroll the year out of here to get ejected from the table or from, from the game. And also they can buy bribes for cheaper and stuff to try and make this not happen. And they can basically foul with impunity or at least with some padding to not get kicked out. And then a touchdown, if you manage to end the, uh, the ball in the opponent's end zone uh, during an activation, you immediately get a touchdown, you score, uh, and you reset the table, um, and the kicking or the receiving team, or the team that scored becomes the receiving, uh, kicking team, and the team that was scored against becomes the receiving team. Uh, there's also rules now for stalling, which I think is important. So a big thing in Blood Bowl would be you want to wind the clock down. You want to score later in a turn if you're going to be in advantage because you don't need to to score anymore. So if you're ahead, you might just hold the ball near the end zone. There's rules for stalling now. Um, it's a valid tactic, but can get risky. If at any point your team, uh, turn, uh, your team turn, a player belonging to your team meets all the following requirement, you're considered to be stalling. If the player is open, if they have the ball, if the player is able to activate and perform their declared action without having to roll a d6, so if they're not stupid or something. If the player is able to move into the opponent's end zone without needing to rush or dodge. And failing to activate a stalling player before your turn ends, uh, or activating that player but declining to score a touchdown is called stalling. And it can be risky. And so ending in a drive. So um, basically if you uh, end a drive sequence when your drive ends, uh, either as a result of a touchdown being scored or the half ending, the referee blows a whistle and play halts. Unless the full time whistle has been blown, there's another drive to come, but some things happen. So first you have to deal with secret weapons. Uh, so Owen's pump wagons, for instance, chainsaws, blunderbusses, count as secret weapons. Um, and if either team is wielding any players with them, those players will be sent off for committing a foul, even if they're not on the pitch at the end of the drive. When a player is sent off in this way, their coach can argue the call. A single bribe or inducement may also be used per player uh, sent off in this way if they're <laughs> available and should be the coach wish if they're successful and the player is not sent off. So basically, you have to keep, if you want those things on the table, you got to keep bribing the coach to get them off. So it's not like teams are going to be bribing all the time. Uh, and then you recover your knocked out players. On a roll four plus, the player get, comes back on the reserve box. On a one to three, they're gone, and then the drive ends. And any special rules would happen. And you restart the game. And then sometimes, uh, in like league finals or stuff, if you're drawn at the end of the second half, you get an extra time. And you don't get any extra rerolls. If there's no clear winner at the end of extra time, the players decide in the penalty roll off. Um, uh, to resolve sudden death, both players roll off five times, each rolling a d6 and rerolling ties. The coach who wins the most roll offs wins the game. And then your aftermath, this is just using league play. Um, so you're gonna get things like record your outcome and your winnings, to update your dedicated fans if you gain any new fans from doing well. Uh, your players advance through star player points, hiring, firing, and temporarily retiring, uh, expensive mistakes. <laughs> the players will be irresponsible, basically, and then prepare for the next fixture. Um, and you get star player points for a variety of things. So you get them for um, completion. So you get a point, passing completion, you get a star player point, and a throwing completion. Um, a throwing completion earns a star player point. So both the person making the pass and the person receiving gets a star player point. Um, you've got passing interference, so a deflection earns you a star player point now, and an interception gets you two. Casualties, you get two for knocking somebody out as a casualty, and then a touchdown. Uh, if you get a touchdown, you get three, and MVP for the game gets you four. Um, you get experienced for three, a random skill, uh, six. Uh, you can choose a primary skill or a random skill. Twelve, choose a secondary skill, or uh, 18, get a characteristic improvement. And every time you spend them, 
um, you can spend them on advancement. And the more experience you get, the more, uh, more star player points and a new advancement will cost. A player is not obliged to spend their star player points until they have enough to randomly select a characteristic, at which point they must spend some or all of their uh, star player points. And basically, the more advancements you have, the more it costs for you to do things. And you can always try and do them if you want. Uh, you can improve your movement. You can get new skills from your skill tables. Your value then goes up. And then, of course, if you have too much money in the bank, bad things happen, <laughs> which I think is hilarious. If you have 100,000 gold pieces or more stored in the treasury, uh, roll a d6 to the following table and apply the following results uh, from the column that corresponds to the number of gold pieces you have in your treasury. So if you roll a 1 uh, and you have, uh, let's say, a uh, major incident, <laughs> if you have 300 grand in the bank, uh, a major incident is half the gold in your treasury is lost in unfortunate mishaps. So, like, somebody like like, I don't know, gets in a bar fight and murders a prince, murders a local lord, and you have to, like, bribe your way out of it. Like, your team just does something terrible and slapshot-based. And then you update your team value and your current team value, and you go to the next game. Skills and skill categories, skill use. All skills are in here, including some of the new ones. All your um, attributes, so things like having the plague, being boneheaded, having a chainsaw as an attribute. All your inducements, so everything from like temp agency cheerleaders to part-time assistant coaches. A weather may just change the weather. Buying Bloodweiser kegs can be super important to get your chaos back on the table. Special play cards, which you can still get, but they're just the cost is in here. They're not detailed in here. Extra team training um, for additional rerolls that don't cost rerolls. Uh, bribes to try and bribe people. If you have bribery and corruption, they cost half as much, which is great. Uh, wandering Apothecaries, Mortuary Assistants, Plague Doctors, Riders Rookies, Halfling Master Chefs, uh, Mercenary Players, Star Players, Infamous Coaching Staff, Wizards, and a Biased Referee. And these inducements come out of the difference in team value. So these are used to balance league play when a team is like way more experienced and has way more players. You get this additional stuff basically. Um, and it would consider like, imagine the stadium or the city that you're playing in wants to make it look like a fair game. So they give you some extra stuff to try and sweeten you playing a, a better team basically. And all the stuff for them, room, room for your leagues um, and how you're gonna win your league points. There's a really great detailed like off season stuff in, in here too for how to put in a league, but this is pretty much the same as in every other edition. Basically, you can track experience, you're gonna play games, you play X number of like open games and set piece games, then you play a playoff, then you play the finals, and then you win whatever the cup is for your regional. And the teams, and they're all in here. They're divided by your regions, so everything from the Badlands Brawl down to the World's Edge Super League, and can also have special traits. So either Bribery and Corruption, uh, the favorite of for the Chaos teams, low-cost linemen, their linemen don't count towards the current team value because they're disposable, so Snotlings have that, which means Snotlings tend to get a lot of extra inducements even when they play an exhibition game because you don't actually count their linemen towards the current team value. And then Master of the Undeath, you get zombies. If you kill somebody, you can immediately bring them back as a zombie because your necromancer is the coach. <laughs> and then team tiers. And I like that this is explained in here. This was kind of like an unspoken thing in previous editions of Blood Bowl, but some teams are not created equal to others. There, there's, there's an intentional imbalance in Blood Bowl to try and create teams that are more of a challenge to play, and that just ups the enjoyment of a game of Blood Bowl by playing a wacky gimmick team, like the little guy teams, which are tier three. Both the teams that come in this box are tier two. They're not designed to be super competitive um, and have like a gimmick to them, like the Black Orc and Goblin mix or the Human Nobility team. Um, tier one is the high value teams, the ones that are basically the most, they, they cover the most bases. Tier two is the ones that are a bit more hardworking and have kind of a gimmick, and tier three are the big gimmick ones, like a Halfling team um, or a Snotling team, where it's like, yeah, you're playing with Snotlings. What did you expect was gonna happen? <laughs> And then I can't tell if this is supposed to be Flavor Flav or not, but I hope it is. I hope we have the Doomsday Blood Bowl clock on this guy and that's supposed to be Flavor Flav. But clearly this is the Hype Goblin for this Ogre team. And then all the teams are in here. Now you'll see that there's a bit of a different presentation. Can they hire an Apothecary? What tier they are? Um, and then their, um, their actual like uh, place of origin and if they have Bribery or Corruption or one of the other special rules. So we got Black Orcs. I'm just gonna flip through this because I think a lot of <coughs> existing coaches will be excited to see the new team rules. So Chaos Chosen teams. The Chaos Renegades are in here, which is a mixed team of like Orc, Skaven, Dark Elf, Human, and um, Ogres, Minotaurs, and Rat Ogres. Dark Elf teams, gorgeous new models. The Dwarf team, the Elf Union team, which kind of replaced the High Elf team. 
The goblin teams, the halfling teams, these are both tier three. You might notice because like goblins and halflings are not the most reliable players. Humans, tier one, human no imperial nobility, which is tier two, both from the old world classic. Lizard men teams and necromantic horror teams, tier two and tier one respectively. Nurgle teams, tier two, the ogre team, tier three. They are bashy, but they're also ogres, which means they're dumb and the Noblars are a step below garbage. <laughs> Old World Alliance, which is like the underworld, but for good guys. So you can have, and this is basically what I'm going to be making out of um, my Blitzball box set, because it's exactly what I need. It's half a team of dwarves, half a team of, war, of humans, and then you can have up to two halflings, an ogre, and a um, uh, tree man if you want. So I basically, there's no elves in here, but I can mix my, I can use my, my Blitzball box and my uh, Crumbleberry and Grack to, to make this team, which I'm, I'm pumped about. An orc team which can also hire goblins, even though they don't come in the box set, and now have biggin blockers instead of black orcs. Oh yeah, and everyone has animosity. Yeah, yeah, if you pass, if a model passes to a model that has animosity against, on a one, they refuse to pass, but it doesn't cause a turnover. Animosity in an orc team. Still tier one though. Shambling Undead, tier one. Skaven, tier one. Snotlings, tier three, because of course they are, and have some of the coolest models of all time. Underworld Denizens, which is the Skaven and Goblin mixed team. What elves? And then all the star players. So if you uh, just bought the Almanac like I did, now they're all in here. <laughs> and then you can see there's basically every 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 current range model is in here. Carl Von Kill, Helmet Wolf, Hack from Skull Spike, Grim Iron Jaw, Grack and Crumbleberry, Mighty Zug, the Man the Legend, Morgan Thug Ballista, the classic Blood Bowl Ogre. Willow Rose Bark. And then we got a great index. And that's it. Thunder Valley Greenskins. We close out looking at the new edition of Blood Bowl, the game of fantasy football. So, again, what do I think? Well, if, if the design team took some learning from the previous version and uh, had a bunch of people that truly love Blood Bowl, I think this is the result. You have an incredible value in the box set, which you can see when you go look at the Let's Play, um, just in the quantity and quality of models that you get and your depth of like having star players and all the inducements being in here. You get a comprehensive rule book. The only thing that's not in here is the special play cards. This is, this is a, a, a fantastic edition of the rule book too. It's in hardcover. It has a silk-like uh, bookmark in here for marking your pages and stuff too. And I love the art direction. I love the style and the humor in it. I love that you get a full history of Blood Bowl. Um, if, if 15 year old, 14 year old, 13 year old me was, was playing Blood Bowl for the first time, this box is an incredible introduction to an incredible game. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed that review. Um, again, I think that, uh, that this is, this is a great streamlining too. I'm really happy to see the pulling out of certain things like, um, the need for a step between like your modifiers for a pass, just, you got your passing skill now and it's all built in there. Um, again, and all my quibbles are fairly minor. It's just terminology things like, like nice purple blah, 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 and go for it that don't need to be that way. But that's, that's me, that's me softballing one over to the ground yards who will have, you know, some kind of complaint about everything. Um, and, and, and just thinking that like, you know, I got to complain about something, I guess. <laughs> so thanks for watching. We'll see you for more of these in the future. A ton of ash. Have a here. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you uh, want to support the channel, of course, like and subscribe and hit the little bell below to get notifications of when I post future content. I do post stuff seven days a week. Uh, if you want to support the channel um, further, you can, of course, buy a t-shirt through Spreadshirts, um, buy a measuring gauge or objective markers from Death Bay Designs. Um, or, of course, most importantly, there is Patreon. Patreon is what makes all this possible. Uh, keeps the lights on, pays for the studio costs, pays for the equipment, model costs, and everything else. And most importantly, um, puts food in my kids' bellies and a roof over their heads. Uh, uh, big thanks to everyone past, future, who supported me. Uh, I do this stuff because of you guys, and of course, I will continue doing it as long as I can.